Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And each week I have this wonderful privilege of, of introducing to you men and women who, because of their love for Christ, unexpectedly sometimes, uh, discovered the beauty of the Catholic Church. And so the, our guest tonight, Patricia Treese, is here to tell her story. She's a former mainline Protestant. It's a good title to, because as she'll mention to you, uh, sometimes it was whatever church happened to be there or come and passed, and she'll mention that in a moment. But you're an important part of tonight's program, so if you'd like to give us a call, I uh, would appreciate it. With a question, 1-800-221-9460. And outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Patricia, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Uh, as I mentioned to you before the program, I know I've got one of your books on my shelf, but I'm surprised you've got a number of books, of a number here that are featured at EWTN. In fact, one of the reasons you're here right now, right, you're doing a bookmark with Doug Keck? Yes. Ab about uh, one of your, your newest book, John, uh, Meet John the, the 23rd. Uh, Joyful Pope, I should have my reading glasses on. <laughs> and Father to All. And Father to All, <laughs> yes. Patricia Treese, this is by Servant. Yes. And uh, hopefully later we can talk about this book. Uh, a lot of the audience may not notice, but on in the background of our set, from the beginning of this new set, it's been a couple years now, we have a bust of John the 23rd on the background for a particular reason, because it, his inspiration, I believe, is what's opened the doors for so many to come home in the last 40 and 50 years. Yes. So, But let me shut up a little bit, and then <laughs> you're here to tell your story. Patricia, so why don't we begin at the beginning and give us a little bit of your background. Okay. Um, my mo mother was raised uh, on a ranch in North Dakota, and so they were mainline uh, Protestants in a sense. It was They were on the main circuit line, <laughs> whatever <laughs> Protestant preacher came through. Which uh, probably was uh, every month or, I mean, it wasn't all that often. It wasn't all that yeah. often. And when they came through, then they would uh, notify all the neighbors and they'd go to the schoolhouse and, and they'd have a service. Uh, so I don't think my mother uh, ever thought of herself as anything but Protestant, <laughs> you know, because it, uh, the person coming through wasn't really coming through as a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Methodist. They were coming through as, as the pastor of the Protestant side, because there were Catholics in the neighborhood too. But they didn't. They didn't uh, share services. <laughs> um, and then my dad's roots lay in the South, and um, his mom was very active in in the church, Baptist, Pentecostal. She ran a home for unwed mothers, and she worked uh, to feed the poor and the hungry, and and uh, worked at a thrift shop that uh, my dad's cousin had for her Skid Row mission. You know, they were, they were very involved people. But when I was two, my mom died, and my dad did not go to church after that. Uh, I don't know when he had stopped. I was two, so I don't know when he had stopped. But he always sent me to whatever mainline Protestant church was handy. Were you traveling around then? We, we were traveling around. At the time, my dad was uh, doing construction hmm. of the Grand Coulee Dam and then the Friant Dam and other, other big uh, works uh, of that nature. So we lived one place, and the corner hmm. had a Methodist church. We lived another, and walking distance for a little girl, there was a Baptist church. So <laughs> um, I went to, uh, they were not just independent little storefront churches. They were mainline. Hmm but they were always Protestant. My dad um, had a great heart for the poor, and maybe he got that from his mother, I don't know, yeah. but, but he had heard that the Catholic Church oppressed the poor, so I was forbidden to ever go into a Catholic Church. That was the only real um, um, directive that he ever gave me if I wanted to go to the Presbyterians or to the Lutherans yeah. or wherever I wanted to go um, it was okay with him, but I knew I wasn't to go in a Catholic church. That's an interesting uh, uh, claim that the Catholic church oppresses the poor, which is such a, an absolute well, yes, contradiction and, you know, to today, complete. Today, you know, I, I can say, <laughs> well, he was totally misinformed uh, because the Catholic church all over the world is yeah. the great friend of the poor and they don't yeah. have to be Catholic either. Right. But anyway, that's what he thought. Mm. And so I think the first um, 
um, thing that happened in my my journey uh, with Christ was that probably one of my grandmothers, my Swedish grandmother, my mother's mother, was a very uh, prayerful woman. And people have called her a saint, even though in my family they don't use words like that, being <laughs> Protestants. But I think one of the two grandmas probably gave me some books that were Bible story books. And um, I learned to love Jesus very early. I, I know that when I was five, I wrote a hymn. But I wasn't a pious little kid at all. You know, I was a sock that other kid in the stomach, sort of a little tomboy. Um, but I did love Jesus. And, and I think because of my mother's death and the moves around and then my, my dad remarried eventually and uh, my poor stepmother had mental uh, problems. So, so I had a need for God from a very early age. And so I, I was interested in churches and, and I, nobody made me go to church. I wanted to go to church. But I, of course, never went to a Catholic church. But one day, I found myself in the parked car. My stepmom had gone into a doctor, and I was waiting in the car. And across the street was the forbidden Catholic church. <laughs> and the door was wide open. In those days, church doors wow. at Catholic churches were open so that people could come in and pray. Well. I'm sure you'll understand this. My dad wasn't there, but he was there uh, <laughs> because I wasn't about to do anything that he said not to do yeah, yeah, because yeah. you just didn't. Imprint <laughs> yeah. of his views on conscience. If I you valued sure. your life, you did not cross <laughs> my father. <laughs> That's a real strong imprint, yes, okay. <laughs> so, um, but I got this bright idea. He hadn't said that I couldn't look into a Catholic church. <laughs> So I went across the street, and I went to the door, and I carefully stood on the sill, and I looked into the church. And then something happened, Marcus. Um, it was just a church, you know, a center aisle uh, down to the front and, and pews on either side. But a presence came, and it came out to meet me, and, and it was... It was um, it was warm, it was sweet, it was living. And of course, I didn't know anything about the tabernacle. I was looking straight down the aisle, so I was looking at the tabernacle. And, and that would have been, when approximately would that, that would have been before you know, I, the major changes in the... Oh yes, yeah. I can't remember so. how old I was exactly. I think I was somewhere maybe 11, 12. All right. No older than 13, no younger than 10. Um, but, and, and I had really lost my memory. My dad and I had moved so many times, yeah. and I think I'd been traumatized with so many different caregivers. Hmm. So I just, I can't remember a lot about hmm. my childhood, but somehow I never forgot that. Hmm. I just, I, I just, it, it, was a, it was an experience that has stayed with me my entire life. Hmm. Even though it took me many years to know, that that was Jesus in the Eucharist who was <laughs> reaching out to me with his love. You would have had no, no data to even put no, that no, together. No, no, I never point. heard no, of no, communion like or that. Eucharist or tabernacle. Yeah. And I don't consciously remember looking at the tabernacle. This was yeah. coming. Mm. It came to the door and it, it enveloped me. Mm. Uh, but mm. I know now where it was coming from. But, of course, it was years before I knew, knew what was actually going on. Um, so then the next thing that was important in my, in my journey home to the, to the mother church, to the Catholic church, happened when I was a teenager. We were now living in a place uh, called Sierra Madre, California. Mm. It was sort of a little, little uh, village uh, suburb on the, on the uh, mountains, on the foothills of the mountains. And I got a job in the bake shop uh, after school in summer uh, during my high school years. And one day this uh, man breezed in and he was wearing this flapping, really loud Hawaiian shirt and baggy khakis. And he just looked like he, he was in clothes that he got somebody's cast offs. You know, they didn't <laughs> fit real well. 
But everybody in the bake shop perked up the minute he came in, and his face was, was very Irish, and it was full of freckles, and he was kind of an older guy, uh, but this big smile and just this wonderful warmth. And uh, the, one of the ladies working there said, oh, hi, Brother Richard. And this was a religious. He was a member of the Passionist Order. And unbeknownst to me, there was a big Passionist retreat house up on the hilltop. And he was coming to pick up goodies for the retreatants. And he came many times to do that because they had retreats about every weekend. And I was an aspiring writer, and he was a poet. And he started writing me these little poems to Patty the Ivory Soap Girl, 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. <laughs> and we, we just hit it off. Um, but it wasn't too long after that that my dad died. I was 18 when my dad died. Um, and I was uh, just starting college, and I was going to, uh, to a school that was quite a ways away but still was far from any relatives of mine. And Brother Richard just took it upon himself to, to be my, my dad. He wrote to me almost every day. And one thing I had learned from my dad was that ideas in religion matter. Uh, my dad and I in our, in our perambulations had been in, in uh, Utah at one time and my dad really admired the people there, but he said that their religious theology was not something that he could be part of, even though they wanted him to marry and stay, and so we left Utah. So I had this, this knowledge that it wasn't just who had the nicest church, who, who uh, had the best youth group, or who were the warmest in their greetings, but that there was truth hmm. and that we needed to look for, for what was real and what was true. So I pestered Brother Richard with questions about this church of his. Because you were approaching him with all the, 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 the lingering uh, anti-Catholic agenda that you father had kind of placed there. Yeah, I, w I, I was... I mean, he was talking about truth, but that didn't include Catholic truth. I mean, No, right? no, because yeah. those were the bad guys yeah, okay. who hurt the poor. Yeah. So I, I, I was wary, uh, and Brother just, I don't know where he found the time with his duties, but these fat letters came, and he answered question after question after question. And finally, um, I actually, during my college years, was making the circuits as usual, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Tried the Episcopalians, oh, that was a pretty church. <laughs> <laughs> Tried the Presbyterians, so that was nice, you know, good sermon, and uh, went around to, to all the others. Um, there were a couple that I kind of ruled out because they seemed more like a lecture series than a, than a, a <laughs> church. But, um, but by the time I was a senior, I actually started going to the Newman Center hmm. and went, to, went hmm. to Mass a number of times. Hmm. And, and I, I had, uh, the first time I went to a Luth Lutheran church, found liturgy. And I loved it. I, I, it just answered something in my soul. Mm. So I liked the Catholic Mass. And as I was preparing to graduate, Brother Richard wrote me. I, had, um, I didn't have any money, but, um, but I had a couple of um, savings bonds. And I was going to cash those in and go to Europe before I went to, to work. I had a job on uh, the Los Angeles Times as a reporter. I had majored in uh, journalism. <laughs> So I went to Europe, and he said, Patty, be sure to go to Lourdes. And I didn't know anything about uh, Lourdes, Lourdes, you know, uh, but, but I went there. I knew so little about it that I went in November. <laughs> There's no <laughs> pilgrimages in November. But fortunately, some nuns had a hostel that was open. and That might be a nice time to go, just to, <laughs> you know, just the bazillion crowds. Well, there little, certainly was no crowd. The, um, the quietness of it. Yeah, well, they, they gave me a bowl of hot soup, and then they pointed me, and I went over. And I got over to the, to the grounds, and there was a church that had actually been dedicated, I know, today by John the Twenty-Third in the 50s. And... Um, it's kind of a big, round, modern thing mm -hmm. in addition to the original, beautiful, old church. Mm -hmm. I guess the, they needed more room for all the crowds. So I, I went in there, 
And Marcus, I was absolutely horrified. I saw, I mean, it's a Marian shrine, right? So I saw this uh, great mosaic of the Blessed Mother. And I said, oh no, this is all true. You know, they, they worship her. And, uh, and I, I just was, was horrified. Um, and I, to this day, I don't know why I didn't just turn and run. Um, because I, it, it hit me just like a sock in the stomach. But somehow, by God's grace, yeah. I didn't run. I went down to the, to the actual grotto, mm. and I sat there on a stone bench. It's November. There isn't a soul <laughs> around. It's cold. It's damp. Um, but I had my Bible with me, and I opened my Bible, and um, I opened to John 3, 19, as I was there right by this statue of the Blessed Mother seemed to be looking down at me. I guess I tried to ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> but when I read the words about um, darkness and light and how some people actually choose the darkness mm -hmm. uh, because their deeds are evil and they don't want the light, from that um, scripture, the Lord let me know not that, it, that my Protestant um, family were bad or that the Protestant churches were bad. It wasn't anything like they were the dark and Catholics were the light, nothing like that at all. But he was telling me that I needed to move toward delight mm. and that in my case, I needed to go home and become a Catholic. Mm. And I had no, um, no doubt about it. It was, a, it was a message that was that was real and it sunk right down to my toes. So I went back to the United States and I went to Detroit. Uh, Brother Richard had now been transferred to Detroit to a Passionist retreat house there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was baptized. I'd never been baptized and entered the church at St. Gemma's Catholic Church. And uh, I, I, I want to say, uh, th th it's hard to say this now, but at the time I felt that I was really lowering myself to become a Catholic because all my friends from college, I went to you know a secular sure. college, they really looked down on organized religion mm. and especially those superstitious Catholics. Mm. So I knew what I was going to get from all my friends. Um, and then there was my family. My family were so warm and loving, they didn't disown me or anything like that. But for them to become a Catholic was, you know, oh gosh, this was a terrible yeah. thing to do. Uh, they, they thought that I was turning my back on Jesus instead of the fact that Jesus was calling me to the Eucharist to receive his body and blood. Um, you know, your, your upbringing experience uh, I find interesting because it, it it's so common to so many Christians today where it doesn't matter which church they go to, they go to the convenient one either because they like the preacher or they like yeah. the, the architecture or it's got a good daycare or clean bathrooms or a, an empty parking <laughs> yes. lot. I mean, those are actually yes. literally reasons yes. that church growth experts use to help grow churches to check yes. all those things out. I used to pick out pretty churches when I was a teenager. <laughs> Yeah. And what happens is, on the one hand, because the, the most common denominator between all those churches is Jesus, you can come away with a deep commitment to Him yes. and have an authentic experience of our Lord Jesus. But you all, on the other hand, you end up with a very low commitment to church, to sacraments, to almost anything, even doctrine. Yes. All right. And, and so, you know, on the one hand, an, an openness to any kind of organized religion yes. is a complete 180 degree turn from that for so many of our modern Christians that are out there. Yes. Sometimes it takes a work of grace like happened in your own life. Yes, absolutely. But you know what happened, Marcus? I mean, I had all this theology from Brother Richard, yeah. but, but here I, I think that I'm lowering myself. And I actually had kind of a, a mental picture of this big um, round thing like that Marian church at Lourdes. 
with a little door, and I was going to have to sco <laughs> stoop and go, go into this narrow place. But what happened was when I made that act of humility and I became a Catholic, I found I was in this enormous place, <laughs> and that if I lived to be 500, I would never be able to explore all the intellectual riches, all the artistic riches, all the, all the riches of truth and beauty and joy. And I still have that, that feeling. You know, I've been in the church for many years now, but I'm not done exploring. There, there are just so many beautiful um, spiritualities within the church. You know, if I want to be my grandmother and do the home for unwed mothers and the soup kitchens and everything, I can do that. There's lots of places in the church to do that. If I want to be like Grandma Frieda, my little Swedish grandmother, and be a great woman of prayer, I, I can go to the contemplative prayer groups. I could join a religious order that specializes in that. Whatever it is that I want to be, even if I want to be like my Quaker ancestors and work for peace, yeah. uh, the, it's the all within the, the church. The apostle of the laity within the Catholic Church is, is just a beautiful theology. Every individual layperson has their calling and their gifts. And of course, that is the beauty of our of so many of our spiritualities in the Catholic Church. That it isn't just the same for everyone, the beauty of that. That's and right. a lot of new people coming in don't appreciate that. Uh, although I love your analogy of having to go small because I mean, that's what Bernadette had to do. Remember yes. the first thing that, yes. I mean the, the audience may not know the whole story, but the first thing that Our Lady asked her to do was to get really low. And stoop and, and claw in the mud. <laughs> that's, yes. You know, humiliating in yes. a sense, to be open to the, the fullness of Christ. Now, you began writing. Oh, Marcus, I do want to say yes, okay. one thing to give Our Lady credit. Um, since that time when she was the, the environment for my conversion, all the great graces of my life have come to me through Our Lady's hands. Hmm. So I have the greatest debt to the Blessed Mother, to the Eucharistic Jesus, and to religious orders, too. Yeah. Because where would I have been if Brother Richard hadn't taken me under his wing and hey, answered he, all those questions? I'm assuming that in his letters, he, even though you're shocked when you saw the mural of Mary, but yet his seeds had been planning to help. That, yes. that, that's what the Lord had used to ease your way, to be open to the, the truth about Mary. You just said yes. how all your graces have come through Mary, but the audience may not understand that she points to Jesus. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's all the Blessed Mother ever wants. You know what she said at Cana? This is my son, do whatever he tells you. That's, that's uh, yes, thank you for bringing that out. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that in many of your books you focus a lot on saints. Uh, how did you come in your own spiritual journey to recognize the place of saints in well, this, our spiritual this journey? This was very interesting. You know, from the time I was a little girl, very little. I was attracted to human goodness. Hmm. I just love good people. Hmm. <laughs> um, and when I entered the church, among the many riches that I found there was um, to discover the saints. And the saints just have accompanied me on my journey. Hmm. Um, I asked their prayers just like I asked the prayers of my friends and relatives, and like I asked the Blessed Mother to pray for me. Um, and it's amazing how God sends me saint companions. When I had children to raise, he sent me St. John Bosco with his prevention system. <laughs> and I raised my children according to Don Bosco's prevention system as best I could. Um, and uh, when I faced terrible illness, kidney failure, dialysis, uh, you know, years of, of near-death experiences, so yeah. to speak, um, he sent me Padre Pio who, uh, when I felt so badly that I wasn't suffering nobly, uh, Padre Pio explained that we're made for happiness, so of course we don't want to suffer. And that as long as we, at the apex of our will, want God's will, it's okay to moan and groan and, and pray the prayer I used so much at that time, help, Lord, help. <laughs> um, and you, wrecked, you wrote a book um, about Padre Pio, Meet Padre Pio, which is available here on, on EWTN's catalog. Um, and then tell us a bit about uh, why John the 23rd? Well, I think God knew 
that I, I needed John as a companion. I, it's taken me four years to produce that. Huh. And now I'm, I'm talking about him quite a bit, so we could say we're going into our fifth year together. <laughs> and he's such a wonderful companion because he is such a role model for all of us. You know, he, he didn't have the stigmata like mm -hmm. Padre Pio, or he wasn't a, a great martyr like St. Maximilian Kolbe, on whom I wrote. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he was out there in the world um, dealing with the, the demands of his huge extended family, his siblings, nieces, nephews, parents, and his work, uh, having uh, money situations, um, having his, uh, his stresses from demanding bosses and sometimes jealous colleagues. One of them got him sent to Bulgaria for, <laughs> for nine years. Uh, and he just, uh, you know, he, he had to deal with these human things that we all deal with. I mentioned to you before the show that with all the stresses he had in countries like Bulgaria where he was hated for being a mm -hmm. Catholic, and then he was in Greece during World War II when they were invaded by the Italians and he was doubly hated. Uh, he, he knew loneliness. He knew what it was to be rejected, uh, to be persecuted. And uh, all those stresses led him to be a stress eater. And mm -hmm. I, I think in a way this is wonderful. You know, so many people think that they can't be loved unless they're thin. And we have people who suffer from bulimia and anorexia. <laughs> John was the greatest uh, uh, person of his time as far as being loved by the whole world. And he was fat. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I see that as God, you know, using everything. But. Um, but he, he struggled. But then when he was on the diplomatic circuit, where sometimes they were served a, a meal of 32 courses, you know, and if you don't eat something that's offensive <laughs> to the country that's hosting the meal. <laughs> so uh, One thing I've wondered about is, uh, given the, the places that he was sent, uh, where, as you said, he experienced great persecution and hatred, uh, though he was trying to make inroads for the faith in these places, yes. that I wonder to what extent those experiences shaped his receptiveness to the Holy Spirit in this call to, for the consul. I, I believe that God was preparing him throughout his life for the council that he began. Of course, he wasn't there except for the beginning of it, and mm -hmm. that at that point he had stomach cancer and he knew that his contribution was the suffering. But all of those experiences, rescuing Jews and working with rabbis in World yeah. War II, working with the Muslims, working with the Orthodox uh, for humanitarian things and practicing what I call the diplomacy of brotherly love, yeah. th those prepared him for, for being this pope who could do so many things that would benefit the church. One of the things he did as soon as he was elected in 1958 was to take a very um, unkind phrase pertaining to the Jews out of the Good Friday liturgy. Mm. When it had originally been written, it probably wasn't so bad. Yeah. It just meant unfaithful. But it came, perfidious came to mean, you know, the worst kind of treachery. Yeah. And so he ta had that taken out. Uh, and he, he, the Turks actually, a after persecuting him while he was there, they uh, felt that he was the first Turkish pope, <laughs> you know, so he, he, he made people love him. All right, well, let's take a break, and then when we come back, we'll have some of your questions for Patricia Trees. See you Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Patricia Trees. Thank you for sharing with us your journey. And, uh, Thank you, Mark. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, 
You know, it's interesting. John the twenty third, the Lord had had uh, called him to certain places in his life uh, that at the time would have seemed like great suffering, but yet prepared him for what he was going to earlier. And I even think in your own journey, your experience growing up, bouncing from one mainline church to the to the rest, probably helped shape your own. Uh, the way you understand your Catholic faith and what you try and do in your books. I know one thing you've mentioned in your books is that you're very sensitive to Catholic terminology. Yes. Uh, as I am on this program too, because I know that we have a lot of non-Catholics who watch the show that aren't used to Catholic terminology. Right. And sometimes that terminology can be a barrier to them hearing the truth of the church. And I know in your books you're sensitive to yes, that. Yes, I try to be because I, I. Uh, I don't want to give offense, and and I want to, to build bridges, because as as uh, John said, you know the things that um, that we have in common, there's so many more of yeah. those than the things that that divide us, and we can work together for good causes like pro life or feeding the right. hungry, and learn to appreciate each other, and and hopefully then we we can learn to be sensitive to our terminology so that we yeah. don't give offense when when no offense would be taken if we just phrased it differently. Yeah, and it doesn't mean, people have misunderstood that to mean that we're changing the content of what we're teaching oh, and that's no. not it at all. No, no, of course not. John the 23rd didn't want to change any content no. when he called the, the consul. Now some ran with it afterwards and misinterpreted that, but sometimes you want to say, what well, is, is the way we say things communicating the core of what we mean and sometimes we have to examine that. All right, well, let's take this first email. This is from Bill in Indiana and he writes, Patricia, please tell me either your favorite saint or one of the saints you think helped your transition into the Catholic Church. Thank you, Bill. Well, Bill, <laughs> <laughs> I have at least half a dozen favorite saints <laughs> and, and my favorite saint is um, the saint that God has sent me at that particular time to uh, to teach me some particular truth, but um, I mentioned that Don Bosco, Saint John Bosco, certainly was an enormous help to me, both as a school teacher, uh, which I did for a few years, and raising my own children, and continues to help me now that I am a venerable grandmother. <laughs> All right, and you've also written. Let's see. Did you, was it St. Therese you wrote? Saint yes. Therese? Yeah. Oh, St. Therese has been a wonderful yeah. help to me in so many things. St. Anthony will not listen to me when I lose something. <laughs> so I always ask Therese, and she finds the thing right away. <laughs> oh, that's a Catholic thing. A lot of non-Catholics aren't going to understand what we're talking oh, about. Yeah, I better that's explain right. that one. <laughs> I ask Therese to pray for me when I lose something. Uh, you know, just the way you ask, you have that aunt or that neighbor who's such a terrific person uh, in prayer, uh, such a prayer warrior. And Therese is one of my prayer warriors. Yeah. I ask her prayers and I get results. Well, that's why the church, uh, you know, assigns, recognizes certain saints, our patron saints of unique things. St. Cecilia, music, you yeah. know, so we see these, if you're a musician, then you have a patron saint that you can pray that they would pray for you, ask them to pray for you to help you be faithful with your gifts. Uh, and that's why the saints are, are you know, our, 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 our armor bearers in, as we seek to live our lives according to what God wants us to do. Yes, and St. Paul goes into that so much in Acts, you know, yeah. when he asked the many, in many of his letters, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And in one letter he says, be imitators of those that I have trained. Uh, so. I, I see the church as the Holy Spirit, you know, handing down the faith through Jesus to people like Paul and then Paul to their disciples and on down. And, and we are to imitate them because they love Christ and we are to do that too. All right, thank you. Let's, our first caller is Marie from California. Hello, Marie, what's your question hello. for Patricia? Hello, Patricia. Oh, hello, Marie Oak. <laughs> That's a friend of mine. <laughs> now, now that you've um, now that you've finished the book on Pope John the Twenty Third, are you planning another book, Patricia? <laughs> Maria, well, I'm a, I'm a plant. always <laughs> no, <laughs> I swear, <laughs> but I sure recognize that voice. Um, I I'm always planning a book, 
and then God always comes along <laughs> and I do the book that God wants me to do. So now I've learned. I, I never say what I'm doing next. But thank you for asking. <laughs> I'll be doing something. All right. How many books have you written so far? You know, I haven't counted them. Oh, okay. <laughs> But there's a bunch, at least two here, the EWTN uh, Religious Catalog, if you'd like to find out about uh, uh, Padre Pio and John the 23rd, the two books we're featuring here at EWTN. Yes. But I think this email also touches on another one of your books. It comes from Jim from Florida. Patricia, to what extent did your research involving the book A Man for Others and the experience of Maximilian Kolbe have on your conversion and draw you to the Catholic Church. And thank you for the book, by the way, it has had a profound influence on my life. Thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you, Jim, for, for that. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I didn't write A Man for Others. I get the credit, but the Holy Spirit wrote A Man oh. for Others. Uh -huh. And uh, I was just the kind of the front woman. Uh, I had already been in the church for some time but every encounter with a saint like St. Maximilian Kolbe has to deepen your faith and make you so... Hum Especially you as a journalist and him being a yes. journalist. Yes, and I wrote a documentary biography. I had roughly a hundred people who knew him mm -hmm. and I took their first person testimonies and told his story through the testimonies. Oh, yes. I called it a documentary biography. Hmm. and. You know, if I had just done it myself, people would have said, ah, oh, you know, the, this is too much. This couldn't really have happened. But the witnesses, I was even able to interview men who were in the lineup with him at Auschwitz where he volunteered to die for another prisoner who called out, oh, my wife, my children. Mm -hmm. um, so this was a gift of God to me, and I'm so grateful to have been associated with that book. It's made so many uh, converts and it's helped people in prison. Oh, it's, it's done so much good work. And, and the Holy Spirit was so kind to let me uh, be involved. You know, you're, as a writer, I, I'd love to have you make a comment to the audience, if, if anyone's out there that is trying to discern the calling to be a writer. Oh. <laughs> let me talk about that. It's, it's one of those mysterious things, you know, when we discern God's call in our life. It is mysterious. Well, you know, I, I had inherited um, a gift for, for writing lively, readable mm -hmm. prose. And then I majored in journalism and I got this passion for accuracy and <laughs> learned to hate fact errors. And so um, I, I found that I wanted to dedicate those gifts to God. And that was kind of an inner um, mm -hmm. grace, I guess, you know, it, it was all grace. Uh, that I felt that I, I wanted to give those gifts to God and then God led me to the saints and I found that he, he had equipped me when I wasn't even a Catholic by the things I studied uh, to, to do the work. I, I love languages and, and so I took a lot of French in college and Latin in high school and so on and so I was equipped. So I guess we, we just have to uh, see what our gifts are and then um, be open to how the Lord might want to use them. Your commitment to avoid fact errors, <laughs> I so appreciate because it, it irritates me when you go to a large bookstore and you go to the biography section or historic section and you think you're picking up a good book of history and you're reading it and you recognize that the author is communicating things in a, a matter-of-fact way as if they're true when in fact they're nothing more than that author's opinion, opinion or perspective uh -huh. encurneled around a truth but yet moved in a slant yeah. so that if you have a hundred truths and each one is just slanted a little bit pretty soon the end point is way off base. Yes, and, and that bugs me too so <laughs> <laughs> I, I try not to do that. I do try always to go to the to the original sources as we were talking about before the program I went to the former private secretary a retired archbishop of John the 23rd and he gave me the materials or pointed me and I there were some other people that had been with John that I was able to uh, get in touch with also all right well thank you we have an email from Diana from New York hello what's your question 
Um, Patricia, I was wondering, um, what is the John Bosco method you used raising your children, and where would I find that? All right, thanks, Diana. Um, well, it's called the prevention system, and it's based on reason, religion, and kindness, and being available to prevent children from getting into trouble by just um, always having them involved in music and and um, sports. Don Bosco was a great athlete and musician, but he, he was willing to lay down his life. He was so tired sometimes from being with boys all the time, so they couldn't get into trouble because he was there to prevent that, uh, that they would, he'd literally fall asleep against a wall. <laughs> so it's, it's somewhat demand, and I'm not saying I was up to that, but, um, but I did try to use kindness, and I did try to be available and to, uh, to help my children have a spiritual life. That's where the religion part comes in, mm. uh, a genuine spiritual life. I, I just say one thing about Don Bosco. He wanted to make sure his boys really went to communion because they wanted to, so he didn't let them file out in rows. They just got up from wherever they were in the church and went. That uh, way no one who was in sin would feel pushed to go. All right. And really he, he was very committed to this idea of giving them positive opportunities so that they would be, they could make a better choice than just trying to choose for themselves out there in the world, in their culture. I mean, he was very committed to that, wasn't yes, he? Yes, yeah. very. So probably a life of Don Bosco, they could find out more about oh, this. Oh yes, she asked about that. I hope I have one coming out in a couple of years for his centennial. <laughs> uh, we'll see. You're not making that commitment, but just in case the Lord leads you in that direction. Well, right? I, I've asked the Salesians if they would like my book that I have written on him, which I, you could say a way I wrote it for myself, <laughs> but um, I, it would be nice if it came out because people do ask about, and there isn't much written. About. Uh, about his prevention system. All right. Another email. This comes from Alec from Iowa. Dear Marcus and Patricia, as you began to become a member of the Catholic Church, how did you get over your father's voice, quote, <laughs> in your conscience that had always told you to not enter, a, ever e enter, even enter a Catholic Church? Was it difficult overcoming prejudices from your family and friends who are Protestant? How did you deal with it? Thank you, Alec. Thank you uh, for asking. Um, it wasn't difficult because I knew that my dad was wrong. I knew very early on from my experiences with mm. the church, with the hospitals and the mm. uh, receiving patients who had no money and the, the missionaries helping people and you know, I saw that the, that the church did help the poor and I thought, well, dear daddy was just a victim of his southern prejudices <laughs> and, and that he would have loved the church because he loved everything that was reasonable and that was good. Uh, the second part of the question, refresh me, <laughs> what, what was the second uh, thing that I was being asked? Oh, about whether it was hard. Um, it was, it was hard um, on my pride when my, my intelligent friends from college, you know, we had all been quite intellectual and we thought we were, were pretty hot stuff uh, with our grades and our honors and everything. And, and to have them, you know, kindly dismiss me as, well, she's just eccentric. <laughs> that, that was a little hard on the pride and I'm sure it was very good for me. Well, in, in our work with the Coming Home Network International, We've worked with all kinds of people on the journey. And we've put together a list of barriers that keep people from the church. We've got, I think we're up to 16 major things. But the top three are always about the same. Ignorance, prejudice, and bad Catholics, for want of a better phrase. In other words, ignorance, I just don't know the truth. Number two, what they think they know isn't true. And then sometimes the examples, the models they've yeah. had. I mean, that, in many ways, that explains your own experience as a young person. Didn't have the, the knowledge of the church, and what you were told wasn't true. Yeah. And I don't know how many Catholics you really knew. Well, you know, God was so kind to me because I knew wonderful people who were Catholics. Ah, okay, great. I, I sort of think of myself as a little Excellent. pagan baby out in the mission fields, you know, and this wonderful missionary comes in and he feeds you and he clothes you and he answers all your questions about God and he leads you to Jesus. Well, that's what wonderful, my, the counselor at my high school was ah. Catholic. 
and then Brother Richard and especially uh, Brother Richard, yeah, the woman who became my godmother, who uh, Brother Richard introduced me so to. So I'm thinking that in your example, as for our especially our Catholic audience, I mean, it, I mean, even given a, an ignorance of what the church really taught and then prejudice, that it was the witness of just a regular old Catholic that loved that lived their faith that really opened the door for you for exactly. such a long time. And yeah. also God gave me the grace that even when I was very young, I realized that when people said things about uh, groups, I realized that was silly. Yeah. Um, that, that's a grace. <laughs> Although by God's grace you made it through the intellectual environment of the universities too. Sometimes those can be the most devastating places yeah. in our country when it comes to the Catholic faith particularly. Yes, but fortunately Brother Richard was writing there me almost go. every what day. A, what a <laughs> gift from God. What a had. gift indeed. What a, is, he, is he still here? Is he with the Lord? No, he, he died uh, when I had only been in the church a few years. Is that right? Yeah. All right, let's see, that would have been a sad moment for you. And, and with it was, place in yeah, I was I losing remember. another father. Yeah. All right. I've got another email here, Jerry from Tennessee, Patricia and Marcus. I was raised Catholic, but have been bouncing around in different Protestant churches for almost 30 years. I'm trying to return to the Catholic Church, but feel like I am doing wrong because of some of the teachings I receive that are against the church. Did you have a problem with this? And how would you overcome the guilt feelings? It was a little bit like the last question, but. Yes. Um, you know, one thing that helped me um, was to think about the churches. All these different churches uh, all have some of the truth, uh, or most anyway. Uh, but then, you know, okay, this one started in 1800, this one started in 1600. Now, here's the, the church that Jesus started right at the time that he said, here's Peter, and he promised that he would not let this church be uh, destroyed. So it helped me a great deal to think I'm going back to the real roots. Everybody who starts a new church wants to go back to the roots, <laughs> but these are the real roots that Jesus uh, put in place. And so that's, that's been very helpful to me, and maybe it will be helpful to you in recognizing that there's thousands of people out there who think that they finally have got it right, but um, you know, in this that isn't necessarily true. This question from this gentleman is a, is a really good one uh, because, again, in our work, we deal with people that talk about this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, our consciences are formed, uh, not overnight. Right? That's, that, that's right. all of our life. And some of those things that we've accepted without question make a deep impact in our conscience. Sometimes we end up doing things that are sinful that we didn't know were sinful because of the way we were taught. Yes. The way we were shaped against what God wanted us to do as He formed our conscience. And same thing with things that we learned. And sometimes in the same way that it, it took many years to form these false ideas, it may take a while yes. to work through those voices. And I think we have to keep praying and, yeah. and asking God for help. When I was a tiny child from whatever source, my picture of God was he sat on a throne, he had a beard, he scowled, and he wrote down in a book everything that Trisha Treese did that was bad. <laughs> and I never thought of him ever being pleased. Uh, and I had to overcome that. That took a long time. I think that's one reason God sent John the 23rd into my life, because I could see the love of God in him. So, yes, I, I, I know we, we do get these ideas, and we can feel guilty for no reason, uh, no reasonable reason, and then we just have to keep praying for healing. Yeah, I love that prayer and that's in scripture where the father says, I believe, help my unbelief. Yes. And so uh, the gentleman that sent us the email, I'm going to ask everyone to be praying for him on oh, his journey yes. Uh, yes. to help him deal with truth, yes. to be open to truth and to, and to heal some of those things that he's learned that aren't true, to be open to the fullness of the church. We've got another caller, David in Missouri. Hello, David. What's your question? Hi, uh, Marcus, uh, Patricia. I'm a new convert. I'll be a Catholic uh, one year this uh, Easter. And thanks to EWTN, they helped me out through this for a whole year. I'm your fifth calling. This is my fifth time to call. Uh, my question is, uh, 
I was talking to a friend today trying to explain the confession uh, with the priest, and that's still an issue for me as well. I have a hard time with confession yet, but everything else is going well. I lo- taking communion is wonderful. It's the most uh, precious thing to me in the world right now, taking the, uh, the Eucharist like that, uh, the b- body and the blood. But anyway, um, I'm trying to explain this to, um, uh, matter of fact, I'm going to be doing this for RCIA pretty quick, explaining <laughs> what I know about the... Um, um, so you want the answers pretty, for your for your talk, right, Dave? Is that right, David? <laughs> yeah, I would help out to explain uh, confession to a priest instead of going right to the Lord, which I do anyway. We can sure. do, but I just need a little bit of info right there where I can do something about it. All right, David. Out. Hey, great, great question. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I I always look at it that I am confessing to the Lord, but that the Lord is not letting me off so easy that I can just speak to Him. He's got a human witness there. And I know it's a lot harder. I have a regular confessor, and it's a lot harder to go tell Father Jerome that I've, you know, done this again, or uh, than it would be just to kind of uh, pass it off to the Lord. And and I feel that that's a great grace, because yeah. I know that uh, one's much much um, more apt to really work on uh, overcoming certain faults. Yeah when you have to actually go before a person. But I know that I'm not, I'm not telling Father Jerome, and Father Jerome isn't the one who forgives me. I'm telling God. He's there as a witness so that, uh, you know, he, he sort of uh, ante mm-hmm. up here and be truthful and be thorough. Yeah. And, and then he forgives me in God's name. I love confession. I just want to tell you all, <laughs> all you Protestants, confession is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, I would go on my knees down the whole block if I had to to go to confession. Uh, next to the Eucharist, uh, it's the sacrament I love the most. Yeah, to me, I mean, there, there's great scho- uh, scholarly ways to describe uh, that the mystery of the ordination and and how a priest is an altar Christus and, and all of that, you know, it's great scholarly, theological, philosophical. But for me, the two verses in scripture that, that helped me appreciate confession, and I'm still on the journey, still growing, is first of all, John 20, where Jesus gives the apostles this authority to forgive sins. It's there in scripture. Um, but there's another verse that, I always tie to it, and that's the verse earlier in John, where John, in writing the gospel, reminds us that Jesus knows what's in the heart of man. Yes. He says that. Jesus knows what we need in the great mystery of him knowing our hearts. And how easy it is for us to get off when all we feel we have to do is, you know, Lord, boy, I'm sorry I did that again. Then we move on, so that's all we have to do. And that's what I did for 40 years as a Protestant, and I did the same thing over and over again. Jesus, I'm sorry. As Catholics, we do that, but he knows our heart. Yes. He knows what we need. He created us, and he knows the need for the priest to be the altar Christ. I don't, I don't say it correct in Latin, but to be Christ in our presence. And it makes all the difference, not just because of the guilt factor of going again and again. It's not just that, those Uh are part of that. But also the graces that are there that we receive from that human encounter is powerful. We've got about a minute to go. I always ask this question. Let's say there's a few people watching at home that are right now where you were back before you encountered the beauty of the Catholic Church. What would you like to say to them to encourage them to make the journey? I would like to say that if you want to have truth in its fullness, if you want to have beauty everlasting and ever new, if you want to have love in the communion of saints where all of us, Protestants and Catholics, all of those who don't opt out or join together, if you want to have wonderful opportunities to worship the Lord and to receive Him into your own being, then you want to become a Catholic. (laughs) You will be so happy. It is, for me, the greatest thing in my life. You've been a Catholic how many years, approximately? Uh, I'll bet I've been a Catholic 50 years or 45 or 
I'm terrible at numbers. This well, is why I write books. My only point saying that is you've, you've seen the good and the bad of it over the last 50 years. I have, But yes. you haven't for a second lost your love for the beauty of this church. Oh, never. All right. Well, Patricia, thank you very much thank for you, joining Marcus, us on the for journey home. Me. And thank you for using your gift for writing. Uh, Meet John 23rd and your book on Padre Pio and your other books on the saints. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And you thank, thank you for joining us on this program. I pray that Patricia's witness has been encouragement to your walk of faith. God bless you. See you next week.